Hey, hey, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for Global Entrepreneurship Week. This is the 13th year that we're doing this. We've been going strong since 2008. Thank you so much uh, for joining. Also in this special CMX Connect DC, uh, we're industry professionals who do community building for a living, for our careers, our profession, and we learn a lot. We also make lots of mistakes. So this session, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the state of community over, over the past year and the outlook. And joining me is our awesome guest speaker, Justin Franks. Hello, Justin. Hey, how's it going today? Good, good, good. Um, thank you for joining us. I know we're gonna have a few speakers during the session, uh, but just wanted to, I guess, give you a little introduction. I know, Justin, you, you're at Crowdwork Co-op. You're also part of the DC Cooperative Stakeholders Group. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I've been working over the of course, my life, a lot in systems engineering, I grew up with my, my dad in that field. So had a lot of cables around and uh, a lot of computers. So didn't really know how those related to humans until quite later uh, going through the corporate grind. And then, uh, yeah, about four years ago, finding myself in in uh, startup world and freelancing uh, web design, making that into a, an actual business and seeing that you know, there are a lot of needs out there not being met, but a lot of people seeking each other out and um, didn't really quite, um, even though I had been part of different communities, didn't really understand how, um, you know, how to cultivate one from scratch, because that had kind of always been just institutionally wrapped around <laughs> wherever, wherever we went to. So um, yeah, I've been working in the past years, uh, getting more into uh, the DC Cooperative Stakeholders Group was a group formed four years ago by the Department of Small Local Business Development and a lot of different stakeholders from different uh, you know, entrepreneur spaces and from uh, corporations, from civil society and, and um, as well as nonprofits, and government agencies, and pretty much everyone uh, at the table, the same table trying to come together and see how uh, we can work cooperatively and how we can put our strengths together uh, and break down silos, which um, is what we're also going to do with crowdwork.coop is a venture for uh, being able to bridge resources uh, and, and the digital divide uh, to be able to have people not have to start from scratch and to be able to find community and leverage that, and leverage the assets to, that they already have, the skills that they have and match them to opportunities uh, to, yeah, get them to market. So uh, that's been that's been the past four years of my life. Uh, <laughs> not to say I started four years ago, uh, but definitely have connected with that since then. Just happy to be here. Yeah, really looking forward. To awesome, that. awesome. And I know we have another speaker joining us, um, but just as a recap, Global Entrepreneurship Week annual celebration of everything entrepreneurship happens across 170 countries. We have more than 35,000 global events, and we touch around 10 million people in this one week every November. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the speakers, and we have Molly joining us in a second. We're going to do a little fireside chat. Um, on the state of community, obviously Q and A, but really the mind share, the networking. How do we make all this virtual first um, more value add? So instead of the lecture style, let's just get in and and connect with other people. Um, but here we go. We have Molly joining us as well. Hello, Molly. Oh no, Molly. I don't think we hear you. You're, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Hey, how are ah, you? There we go. Welcome. I'm hey, Molly. Happy to be here. <laughs> so, so Molly, you're your CEO of High Caliber Events. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, High Caliber Events, I actually started as a small boutique experiential agency. Been working in experiential for over 13 years. And then I decided to go out on my own and start my own agency in order to help the divide or bridge gap with multicultural marketing and create those opportunities for brands that really need that, um, that be able to speak and um, talk to that audience because I know it well, obviously, from my background and also working with many brands and all types of cultures. Um, I wanted to get an agency that was focused on uh, multicultural marketing and targeting that audience. Awesome, awesome. And I know we've connected through throughout the year. So me, Molly, Justin, and, and Brandon, who, who can't, can't join us today, but we all connected through community building. We, we all do different things across the Washington, D.C. area. 
For example, um, we all came together for a program called BridgeX. So we try to, how do we help other community builders, in a sense, uh, bridge <laughs> to their to their potential buyers and customers. So that's been an interesting journey. But I, I think <laughs> um, this year kind of threw us off course. It, it's a it's a virtual first environment now, and that kind of comes up to the first question. I feel that we want to kind of chat a little bit about is, you know, what are some of the challenges that we're facing? I guess in a virtual first environment, what have you seen? Um, through your own efforts and experiences. Did you want know, me to start? Justin. Oh, Justin. Oh. Well, yeah, go ahead, Molly. Um, for me, be, um, for me, um, I would say the the major things that are missing are obviously like human connection, um, being able to really emotionally connect. And, and build that with your community. Um, you know, I produce events for a living. So uh, I think that's one of the biggest barriers is just being able to meet face to face, um, you know, get a feel and, and feel the energy of people around you and then really connect. Uh, and I would say that's probably one of the biggest things. And then also, um, yeah, just the energy, you know, is different. Um, now in terms of the, the what we're doing yeah absolutely yeah i would add to that um definitely has introduced a whole new uh, light on technology obviously it's kind of the you know, inner yeah. on gorilla in the room uh, how we are really dependent on the capabilities that we have on the screens in front of us but also you know what we have to be able to have, have access to, be able to know how to adopt, um, just constant, this lag time between, you know, asynchronous and synchronous work now is are becoming more common words. So regardless of whether it's in the workplace or if it's in our personal lives, uh, we're, we're finding that we actually have to address some of these things that we never had before. Um, I'm experiencing a lot of challenges intergenerationally being able to bring together groups that otherwise would never uh, maybe connect with each other. And um, while there are advantages to, you know, the internet being able to not have proximity be a barrier, um, it's still, you know, someone living down the street could still technically might as well be overseas, <laughs> depending on how well their, how good their internet connection is. And so that makes can grow together a little differently. Uh, it it makes it a little tougher to build trust into that. Uh, so building trust is a lot easier when you have you know people show up in the same room. You all can chip into a pizza, uh, some drinks maybe, and or you know have different forms of doing that. So how we build an experience around around what we're um, trying to build, what is, how we define. I think we're um, having to approach a lot of those questions. That's, that's definitely something um, I think a lot of people, depending on where they're coming from, um, what type of community, if it's in the workplace or if it's just, you know, even with family and connecting with, with folks there, or if it's, um, you know, finding finding a new group to be a hobby uh, and maybe not knowing where to start. So uh, what are the things out there that, you know, could provide that support system that uh, was there before or, you know, had at least the path, the roadmap was there. And there's a lot of different ways that we're. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, so, you know, I work at Techstars and I have to do different community programs like startup weeks, um, startup weekends. And, you know, we're finding um, a few things that are a few best practices um, after all of these different activations is one is that we, we really need somebody to be there to, to provide tech support. As much as we didn't have to worry about that before, somebody just has to be there kind of in that role, in that setting, 
to kind of help people because there are going to be some people that just don't know how to find the tech or no, don't know the link that they have to get to, and it all ruins that user experience. So, from from a from a community building perspective, you know how to make sure that we're engaging people properly, or if they're getting frustrated, how to show them that we're there and we care for them <laughs> by giving them the answers to when they get frustrated. So, you know, having a specific role for that is something that we're finding important. Another thing is, I think. In this virtual first environment, you know, I connect with you guys through through other means like WhatsApp. So we say connected and we engage, but lots of these virtual first environments they they tend to be lecture based, right? Uh, which is nice, but you know, at the end of the day, we want to be there to connect with other people. And I haven't found a good way to connect with Molly, J Molly or Jane or Joe or John, you know, when I'm in another event. Like I, I love Zoom, um, but. Sometimes they close the chat function, so I can't even chat with other people there, um, or they don't even allow questions. So I'm just staring at a screen, and that's a little boring. So, you know, it's it's how to engage people is one of those things. So we're that's why we're trying something like Icebreaker to kind of facilitate a bit more interaction and, and connection points. Um, but yeah, just you know, user experience, community building, just the engagement piece, and and being more intentional um, with how the other people are going to be interacting with you. It has been super critical. I know somebody, to your, to your point, Justin, where it's great that we're breaking down ge geographic barriers, right? So people don't have to travel far and wide. But even then, you know, the engagement piece, and if you don't allow for people to connect one-to-one, -one, you know, it, it's, you know, their experience gets cut in half, I feel. And, and then two, there are some um, traditionally underrepresented groups that just don't have access to internet. So, you know, how do, how do we start engaging those people, which I still haven't you know, figure that out. But there's lots of things that come up in a virtual first setting for sure. And I know this this leads into to, to something else called, you know, how much of this is transactional versus relational? I know you, Justin, had definitely some interesting ideas there. Yeah, and uh, it's kind of how we, a lot of these parallels can be made with how our economy works as well as uh, we're, we're shifting our and the mode of how we are communicating around the way we you know, are, are meant to work or expected to work. And we're trying to apply that to other parts of our lives <laughs> and uh, we're turning into deliverables, and, you know, as a chore to, to uh, you know, talk to, to people sometimes when it requires sitting in the same chair that we're working in all day. And so it it is kind of like checking the boxes sometimes and, okay, yeah, we're, we're on the same page. We still trust each other. Uh, I don't feel like, you know, we're on completely different paths. Uh, and and that's also, um, yeah, it's also sometimes where the, it's definitely highlighted the need for uh, culture. And to Molly's point earlier about how we are kind of in a, right now we're seeing each other in a vacuum or like, you know, depending on what the platforms that we're on can provide us experience with. and. We're seeing each other in 2D, uh, so we're not able to really contextualize the space. And uh, without other people there in real time, uh, it is a uh, definitely a burden to be able to find common passions and be able to have those you know, like cooler talk conversations that we always talk about. But this, it's a real it's a real thing. Uh, the cooler also exemplifies just any conversation you have. You know, um, outside or being able to take things off a specific platform and maybe you walk into a different room and maybe you're, you know, just changing your environment. So we think about just our environment more uh, and we apply that from how we're trying to address it at a you know, macro level of politics in our country and, and the, you know, international space to, to actually just how we communicate in general and what, how do we create a really generative a healthy environment that we can foster more of a trusting relationship and bond around each other. So we really genuinely care about the other person we're talking to. It's not just that they feel removed and that we're just looking to each other. Because yeah, it's, it's a little harder to do that. And when you're sharing a space and you're sharing the costs of a couple of space, then you don't want to have someone else leave and then you're putting the whole bill. So there are even like common elements like that. What are the baselines? What are the common denominators that really ensure that we're able to, to trust in, in each other 
and and not have it be kind of this feeding into the you know, winners and losers um, and, and trying to yeah just be able to have a zero sum game. And, and you know on that note you know this this concept of culture comes to mind and i know you molly speak on culture a lot can you share a bit more as to what you're seeing as it relates to culture and and how to leverage that uh, more effectively yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was actually, uh, I, I like this topic, relational versus transactional, because I went through a coaching program because I'm also a coach, a business coach. And the one thing that I noticed was, you know, companies are creating new jobs to um, to bring people together in a, in a different way. So the culture or work culture has changed a little bit, right? Because everyone's working remotely and one thing we were talking about uh with other coaches was the the ability to be in cri be in crisis leadership versus crisis management because it takes a different type of empathy when you're dealing with any human being you know across whatever culture um so speaking to culture um i would say in this in, in my area of experiential, it's given people the ability to really tap into other communities and bring them together and also allow access because that's part of what happened during the pandemic was how do we give access, how do we create, create something so people can sit at home and learn or come together. So I think it ha two things happened was one, if you were willing to um, stretch yourself and look for resources, you were able to find things that you could help expand, um, you know, whatever area you needed, like school, um, resources through uh, technology. Um, they were giving away free courses. You know, colleges were giving away free courses and certifications. Um, and so I think it, also, it allowed us a little more access uh, in a way, because they were empathizing with uh, various communities that didn't have access before, so I thought that was really interesting. And then, um, and then for my side, and, and I'm not sure if this makes sense. It might be just kind of rambling, but um, the relational versus transactional is: if you're a leader, you ha and or you're a small business owner or an entrepreneur, it was it really comes down to uh, emotional empathy and what you what you want to do with others and how you want to move forward with your leadership in whatever position you're in. So um, I think that has a big part to do with the culture now is where what is leadership doing to empathize with the, you as a remote worker and also what are we doing as leaders to help also bridge the communities that don't have access and there's a divide there. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I was kind of going that way. But emotional empathy need, I think, increased a little bit. But then there were, I saw some companies that also didn't care. We've read articles about companies that don't really care that much. Like they're gonna, you know, force people back to work. Um, they have to come back to work, regardless of the pandemic. So I think um, all of those play a part, but. Empathy across the board, leadership across the board. There is a there's different different tactics and and uh, learnings here as we you know cross into the next next phase of of the pandemic. Yeah, and, and you know that kind of goes into future outlook. Like, what are some of the best practices or hindsights that you've all learned, um, or what do you what what do you feel you're going to try to tackle in 2021 to build community better or more effectively? That's part of the campaign. How about you, Stephen? Did you want to start? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so, I think for us, so, so at TechStars, I, I think one where we're not looking at, at, at view counts um, as much as we are looking for engagement. So are people commenting in the box? Are they commenting? Are, 
are they getting, are they asking questions? Are they getting their questions answered? Um, are they showing emotion in some way so that we can kind of gauge, are they feeling good or bad about this? I mean, we try to do MPS as much as we can, but I think for us, we just want to be and feel community. So how much engagement can we, can we naturally grow organically through any of the activations that we do? Two is we have to kind of think through, you know, for 2021, how can we make, how can we streamline these tools more easily? Like it's nice that we're hopping people into Zoom um, and then we're trying to hop them into other tools to kind of get other engagement activities going on. But the more people hop, the more they get confused and the more likely they're, they're likely to check out. So we're trying to consolidate as much as we can and minimize the tools that we use and try to use the same tools um, over time so that people kind of get a feel for it. Um, similar to how people know how to use Zoom because that's what almost everybody uses, so they feel comfortable with it. So how can we, you know, create more comfortability um, with the people and the tools that we're that we're trying to use? So being more intentional in that sense, and and I think uh, above anything, you know, just making sure that we continue to keep a pulse on what they're looking for. Um, we may think we know what they want, but that's not always the case, has always been true in a physical world environment as well. So we wanna make sure that we continue that. Like our whatever engagements we do, whatever um, education materials or lectures that we provide, you know, is this of value to people? Otherwise, we, we they're not gonna check into the door and we lose them before we start. Awesome. That's amazing. What about you all? What other insights do you all have? I'm happy to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, I've been seeing a lot of just overall, there's a lot of uh, trend towards consolidation right in, in the market. You see a lot of acquisitions of different platforms and, uh, and mm -hmm. platform economy is something that is becoming a new buzz phrase, right? Uh, so what link do you share with me? Uh, you know, where are we having, where are we having a meeting? and uh, how do we connect between those? Uh, what time are people available? And uh, I think we're spending a lot more time in our calendars uh, and going, bouncing back and forth between emails uh, to try to figure out a window of time that works for everyone. And, and it's impossible to get everyone in the same room at the same time. So uh, being able to keep the better logs on, on what decisions are being made and you know who is involved in those and how do we, main, how do we maintain a diverse community uh, and that's going to take more platforms to be built uh, it's going to take more intervention uh, by different stakeholders and it's not going to be really dependent on um, what drives the most profit but what drives the most value which is mm -hmm. could be profitable <laughs> it's you know it will be profitable if it's a value but really you can throw a lot of money at something, but doesn't mean it's going to. It's a good business model, or it's a good community model, uh, and a good engagement model. So uh, it's it's definitely testing us all. Um, we're trying not to be bottlenecks and figure out how we really incentivize engagement and reward that and recognize that, and also how do we nurture for leadership and how do we um, foster that diversity in the ownership and of the space, so that community managers usually. You know, have they've helped facilitate, but they're not necessarily micromanaging every you know tiny instance of a community. And so, we're we're how do you build more of that connective tissue? And just so that you maintain the trust, the environment is healthy. And I think having that um, is really gonna yeah just be crucial to uh, be able to have the feedback loops really built in and. and I think we're still testing some of those things. So through surveys and polls, and uh, it's hard to get people to fill out surveys. Uh, but you, a lot of different people have different data sets and, and are open to sharing what they know will be a value to other people. So the conversation around privacy and around people, what people are willing to share uh, is going to you know, form a lot more partnerships between the public sector and, and the private sector and uh, the, yeah, civil society. So. Um, definitely a learning process. I don't think we have all the solutions, but it's that constant curiosity and sharing notes <laughs> that's going to get us there. Mm. Yeah, sir. Um, I actually will just piggyback off of what you both said. Obviously, engagement, incentivizing, and being that connective tissue from a from a perspective in marketing. If you're a brand, 
I think the future outlook or what you should be thinking about are how do you keep it, how do you still make it personable and how do you create an experience, whether it's virtual, hybrid, or potentially in person, what feels and looks right for your brand um, and how do you make it personal still. And if you are a brand that was traditionally brick and mortar, or if you were a brand that was traditionally online, now and in future is a great time to build community and really hyper-focus on the communities that you haven't been able to build in the past. And that's what's really great about now is everyone is online, if they can be online, and you can tap into it, tap into specific communities and build, build those communities in a very uh, intimate way. So. You know, from an event perspective or experiential, it's like, how do you keep it personal and still create that human connection, even if it's virtual, and then also serve the community in a way that it's not, again, about a profit, it's about providing the value. And then, um, and then thirdly, just look at building that intimacy within the community that you haven't tapped into before, because you'll find that that's probably what they're they want and need, you know, so as a business owner, as a leader, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur is create the community that you need because if it's not there, then somebody else is probably looking for that community and to bring people together. So I think those are three, uh, three areas that, that you could focus on. Awesome. Awesome. And, and I know, you know, I don't think we have to make the point that community is important right? Um, you know, it helps with engagement and usually organizations improve engagement by up to 21% through online community building. So and that's from Vanilla Florence report. It also helps with feedback um, for product development. So, you know, the best way to build a product is to focus on a, on a problem people have. And so, you know, what better way than through a community where people will tell you what the problems that they have. And of course, you know, you want brand loyalty. If people want to remember your brand, community building is one way to get them to really yeah. trust and remember you so that they can keep buying from you and ideally be loyal to the product and services over your competitors. Um, but I know if there's any questions, um, we're ready for a little Q&A. So if any questions, pop them in the chat. I know um, Rhonda mentioned that, you know, concept is great. Major issue was my login process. It took me many channels to just get to the main page. Um, so yeah, so I guess a question there is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you minimize um, trying to have so many jump off points? And I guess I know from my perspective, it's just you know, pick the critical tools that are necessary and try to try to do as much as you can within those tools so that you're not confusing people um, too much over over time. Is my take on that. Yeah, that uh, what was the question again? Well, no, they were making more of a comment oh, in that time. Okay. Yeah, the login process, uh, there's a lack of standardization, which has, is a blessing and a curse because <laughs> we have, you know, oh, okay, everyone already has Zoom. Maybe that's easier to use, uh, but then maybe that's not the best um, experience that, you know, we're going to have okay. to adapt to. So uh, there's that, that push and pull. And what is recorded versus not recorded, and how do you maximize uh, the time spent together? But yeah, there's always going to be the technical barriers we're seeing now, and I think we're still in the learning stage, uh, unfortunately. But we're we're experimenting. I think we're uh, the necessary thing is just to stay curious and to uh, persist in that login process because we're we're going to be logging in somewhere, uh, and once we you know really get there, once we're able to be present from the start be able to start maximizing those experiences and just kind of starting, you know, it's kind of uh, day zero, really. I mean, not for year zero, I would say uh, now that we're having to reflect on on what we've usually just been accustomed to, it's already been downloaded, it's already been, you know, utilized. So uh, great, yeah, great uh, <laughs> just observation because that's something we're also trying to. I know yeah, the I know we're, is go ahead. Hey, go ahead, is whenever you're creating something, if it's virtual or an extension of a, like a live event or trying to create something for your community, 
I think some some key things to keep in mind is what is purpose? Have an intention. Make sure it's it's valuable uh, and and brings the community together. Then be mindful of like you don't need to do everything on this one in this one event. It's like what 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 is the biggest impact and the biggest value you can provide? Whether it's a dating, online dating, virtual dating thing, you know, where people get together, you know, be intentional about that one purpose and then do it well. Awesome. And I know we're, we're coming up on time. Yeah. Um, so we're going to jump into the Mindshare Networking, as we call it next. So we put the link right there to join the icebreaker. You should likely already in it. But for those who are finding us on YouTube or Facebook, uh, join in, and we're about to go to one-on-one -on -one roundtable mindshare networking. So super useful to build relationships with other people, other community professionals you may not know. And, you know, Justin, Molly, and me, you know, we're, we're across the community. So feel free to connect with us. Also, you know, we do these every, every month almost. So join CMX Connect um, to kind of connect with, with other community professionals. Hopefully we can help each other grow and accelerate our community building. Any any last words, Molly or Justin, for the for the crowd? Any words of wisdom as we go into 2021? Just say persistence and just keep at it. Uh, it's going to take a lot of people have different languages, so um, they're not always going to enjoy the same things, but always just keep your ears open. <clears throat> and uh, things are, yeah, things are still in a design process. So uh, just keep creating and keep keep innovating and thank you because it's it's important work um so let other people um yeah help other people become leaders that will yeah help our jobs as well um, for me i would just say um it innovate in, it, innovate to inspire you know don't just take it as one um new product what is the what is it that you're providing to inspire and bring people together because i think that's where the future is in terms of uh whatever business you're building you know innovate to inspire and bring people together because that's needed more than ever awesome and I, and I will say that you know do the best you can but keep on trucking uh thank you for all that you all do as community professionals. Um, it sometimes it's a thankless job, but thankful to you all for what you do to keep our society, our fabric of society together <laughs> in a sense. So thank you so much, Justin. Thank you so much, Molly. Hopefully you all learned a few things and or have some ideas for 2021. And hopefully we'll see you at the Mindshare Networking. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of Global Entrepreneurship Week. Thanks, Thank you, everyone.